Daniel, if you want to answer the question I was asking uh, Thomas, I was asking if we're talking in terms of NGOs or even solidarity enterprises, if they want to adopt blockchain to as an operational model, what are some key um, key lessons or key things they need to do? And, I mean, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. again. I, I can I can do a, a quick sum up. I, I was I was I was basically answering in the chat, but um, yeah. I mean there is an ongoing actually. There's there's a local working group on how to manage these kinds of things. Like it's mostly supported with international NGOs and people like um, yeah. I think it's Git Crypto and other initiatives. You know, to just to channel donations. So most of the most of the local NGOs that are doing these kinds of things are basically receiving donations in another jurisdiction because the, the Venezuelan jurisdiction doesn't really um, comply with how you actually can manage these things. For, for the sake of transparency, uh, basically they are getting those kinds of donations either in the US or in Europe. Um, and that is, that is one of the main things, but there's also an ongoing conversation on like uh, what other ways can they benefit from cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and blockchain in general uh, in terms of managing their capital and even 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 other kinds of things. And for example, um, with trust lines, uh, we experimented a li a li uh, some time, just just a tiny bit on the potential of using trust lines to generate kind of like a time, ba time banking spectrum for volunteers. So or big NGOs called basically share volunteers between them, like uh, with a specific skill sets and stuff like that. Um, it's very tricky because yeah, it's, it's difficult to comprehend. Um, that is one thing, but it's, it's an ongoing thing going on right now. The other thing is basically um, thinking about which was the other part of oh, solidarity economies in general uh, down here. Um, we had we don't really have as, as many, but we do have uh, civic innovation labs uh, running and doing field work down here in Caracas and Venezuela in general. There, there's a good number of groups uh, trying to you know, to understand how do we share resources. I think one of the best examples that I can think of how the pivotal moment was that when we had the massive blackout in the country. So people basically, either they said like, I had a power plant in my home and I'm gonna just do the thing for myself and nobody else. But the people that actually tried better were the people that were sharing resources in small communities and organizing themselves. And there has been, an awful lot of experiments in that way in Venezuela, not necessarily with cryptocurrencies, but there had been moments in the local economy when a small group of people in a, let's say in a commune, a sponsor even by the government, they got together, they decided on, on printing their own bill and started trading by themselves. Not crypto power, but those things do happen. So it's how do we scale these things with the technology and thinking about like the, like the kind of hurdles that people can run into just because they don't have the best smartphones, they don't have access to the best uh, Wi-Fi connections and whatnot. So it's it's very tricky, but there are, there are very much a lot of people working on how to use like uh, systems like, you know, those systems with SMEs, uh, just to get a kind of like a small panel with options just to handle your crypto and stuff like that. There are tests being, being put together down here. Uh, by the people of Emerging Impact, for example. So I just rambled a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> you no, got no, me off guard. <laughs> it's okay. We're happy that you were able um, to join us. Uh, I know you had circumstances. Uh, Roy, I want to ask you the same, uh, the same question in terms of like NGOs and small scale enterprises in the context of Kenya. What are some key things they need to have 